welcome back to the Club Innovators podcast. Today we have a little bit of a special episode. We won't be harping as much on membership sales or CRM or anything like that. Uh, our special guest today is our tour brand ambassador here at Capstone Hospitality. He is Frankie Sappin the Third. Frankie, welcome to the show. Thank you for uh, for having me. I'm I'm pumped to be with you too. Absolutely. And so, uh, for those of you listening that don't know our relationship. Frankie is our tour brand ambassador here at Capstone Hospitality. He is currently on the Corn Ferry Tour, uh, really having a great second year off to a hot start. And we're going to talk a, talk about that a little bit here in a second. Um, but Frankie, how are we doing today? How's everything going uh, over there in Texas? Doing well. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a solid day. Got some PT this morning and uh, just been hanging out, about to head to the course. It's been uh, like two and a half weeks at home now which is, we don't get that very often, but with, <laughs> with the final corn free event after a couple in a row being 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes West to me is, it was nice to just stay at home and then had an off week, or I guess, you know, two off weeks. So it's, it's been great. Been enjoying being here for a little bit, practicing, hanging out all as well. Yeah. So obviously now you're living, correct, if, correct me if I'm wrong, is it Frisco that you're living in? Uh, just south of Frisco. So it'll be okay. close to Addison. It, it's called Farmer's Branch, but Farmer's Branch is a pretty small community. So it's roughly, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes north of downtown Dallas. There you go. So you've gone from Frisco. You obviously spent some time in Minnesota. You've lived in South Florida in college. And then you're also, was it originally from Arizona as well, correct? Uh, yeah. So born in Minnesota. And then we always split time between Minnesota and Arizona growing up. And then actually spent a little bit of time in Texas, was here for, I think, six months. I tried a school here in, uh, I believe it was seventh grade, and went to a <laughs> golf academy. So I spent a little time in, in Texas before, um, and then it, it just didn't really work out. I had two two sisters, and I don't think they wanted to, to move from, from their friends and, and everything. So yeah, I spent some time in Minnesota, Arizona, obviously Alabama, South Florida, and, and now Texas. <laughs> so well traveled he is. Yeah. Um and you know and really the first thing we're going to start talking about is probably something that you're you might be even tired of talking about right now but obviously you had a tremendous round at the Vertex Vertex Bank Championship. You know, you opened up uh you shot a 58 in round mm -hmm. 1. You you broke a couple records there and and really had a great weekend. So can you talk a little bit about that and how that felt and and kind of how that entire weekend went? Yeah, as as you can imagine, to start like that felt felt pretty incredible. Um, you know, I've been putting a lot of work in the last last couple months, and um, it's been fun to see some progression uh, progress progression <laughs> on uh, on the results side. Um, which I think, obviously, I think results are just kind of a a, a mirror image of of your process and and kind of what you've been doing. So it's it's been fun to see some results there, but. Yeah, no, it was it was great. I think you know i I've had I had Damon Green caddy for me, who caddied for Zach Johnson for 15 years. He caddied for me in in Savannah and then Sarasota, and we had a couple of top tens. and And then he wasn't able to do uh, the the Veritex event, so you know I was kind of trying to figure out who I wanted on the bag. As you guys know, I had my mom on the bag for a fair amount last year, so I was thinking about bringing her back and. You know, I got connected with this guy through Damon originally, um, and then you know, just kind of some through some circumstances, we we got reconnected. And his name's Rusty Stark, um, so he caddied for me in in Texas. I guess what was it? Almost two weeks ago now. And you know, I think we we really just did a lot of great prep work Monday through Wednesday before the event. Um, having played all pretty much all these courses, um, I feel very comfortable you know, with at least knowing or having a better idea of how it's going to play or just where to be and stuff like that to where I'm not grinding as hard, you know, Monday through Wednesday, trying to, to, to know every single detail about the course. It's more just kind of getting myself and um, my game in the right spot to, to hit a lot of, a lot of solid shots. And, you know, Rusty and I did a lot of great work on Tuesday. We went out to my home course, Merido, um, and just kind of got some numbers, hit some shots. And, you know, after that range range session, we were probably hitting balls for three hours and we were just hitting it really, really good. Um, <laughs> so I, I had a feeling it would be, it would be a good week. And then, yeah, to, to start off with 58, it was, uh, <laughs> it was pretty cool. Yeah. We, um, follow you quite closely, obviously in the office and Tyler kind of shoots me a text. He's like, 
Frankie's going low today. And, uh, and then we kind of kept checking in. So I pull up my phone and I'm like, he birdied again and he birdied again. All right. He eagled this. All right. We we're like, Whoa, what's going on? Yeah. So it was uh, super exciting for us. Yeah. I'm, I, hey, I'm, I'm glad to entertain. Um, <laughs> but we're living vicarious through you here in, uh, in Northeast Florida, Frankie. Good. I love it. It was kind of funny how that round went though, is because the first holes, a drivable par four. Um, I actually drove it. I had like 12 feet for Eagle Saturday and Sunday, um, maybe maybe 15 feet. But uh, we I started on that hole and I didn't birdie that hole. And then went to two, hit a nice iron shot. Went to three, hit a nice iron shot. And then picked up a couple on uh, four and five. So then we were four under through five, and off to a great start. Um, Obviously, and then seven is another really short drivable par four, and I drove it right up next to the green, had a very basic chip, and didn't get it up and down. I was like, no, I, <laughs> like I missed that one. Um, but then went to eight, hit another good iron shot, didn't make birdie, and then eagled nine. Um, and when we eagled nine, you know, we turned at six, and the wind played such a big factor uh, in the tournament. Of, um, you know, two weeks ago, it was very interesting to where the easier holes played easier and the harder holes played harder. Um, so then when we got to the back, uh, 10 was a par five and it was pretty much downwind, um, kind of crossed down, uh, birdied that one. And then 11, 12 were two fairly solid holes, like the more solid holes on that course and was able to pick up two there. So then I'd say kind of after that hole, we, we got to a stretch where 13, 14, 15, 16 are all downwind and short. Actually, 13 is not downwind, but it's very short. So that one, I birdied, birdied 13, and then 14, I had like 50 yards in, uh, got up and down. 15 was a uh, short par three, and the pin was in a bowl. So hit it, kind of worked it down the slope to two feet, tapped that one in. Then it was kind of funny, like standing up on 16, because – um, I knew where I was at. There was a little bit of a little confusion and people asking, you know, did you know where you at? Did you know you shot 68 and all that stuff? And I'll, I'll get into that in a second, but standing up on 16, I was like, man, this is literally a three wood into a par four. Like we still have three holes left. One of them is a par five. One of them is a drive in par four. We, I mean, we've got to keep going. <laughs> um, so then drove it up next to the green, got up and down and then actually had probably 15, 18 feet for birdie on 17, just missed that, and then didn't hit my best tee shot on 18 and was able to to walk away with, with par, um, which, you know, I knew I was 13 under. Um, however, I kind of forgot the par of the course. So when I had that 8, 9 footer for par on, on 18, I thought that was for 59. And part of the reason I got a little aggressive on the wedge shot is because I I thought I was right on 59 and I knew Scotty Scheffler had shot 59 and I didn't really care to tie him. Um, <laughs> so I got a little aggressive and then I guess it turns out, you know, all, all I need to do is make, make par to, to beat his, his record. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased that, you know, walking off, I asked my dad, you know, what was that? And he goes, I was 58. Yeah. Love it. That's an incredible <laughs> story. And it's, it's so interesting to listen to you very briefly. You just went one through 18 and almost described your entire round to us straight from memory. You're not reading off anything. No. So it's, it's pretty, Kyle, there weren't pretty that cool many strokes. That. There weren't that mm -hmm. many That's strokes. That's true. Yeah. Right. You didn't hit the ball that many times. <laughs> the less, the less there are, uh, they get easier to remember. That's true. Yeah. You know, so I love, um, you know, a lot of memorable shots. Like I can still tell you the number. I could almost put myself in that situation, like feel the wind, have the same visuals. And yeah, it's pretty fun. And just a weirdo. <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's actually, it's fantastic to hear you say that. And it's so interesting as a guy who's a little more outside the golf world than, than a lot of uh, people around our office. So, so before we get into kind of the meat of it, we want to back up a little bit here and mm -hmm. can you kind of share the story about how you first got into golf and really developed a passion for the sport of golf? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, growing up, I was born in Minnesota and, um, you know, I've, I have two sisters and uh so i'm the the only son and my my dad grew up playing sports love sports and he just really introduced me to everything um you know not having any brothers he was almost like my big brother to a degree 
Um, so he just wanted to introduce me to, to everything. And uh, at the time we, we lived on a golf course. So it was pretty, pretty easy for us just to kind of go into the backyard and hop out on the green in the evening and, and roll some putts. And I think I just, my love for the game started from a short distance. Like I just loved hitting, you know, two, three, four, five, six footers, um, seeing how many I can make. I would do like that clock drill, just put balls around the hole. And at the time I'm two, three years old. I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm not doing a drill. I'm just having fun out there hitting putts and, you know, kind of just worked back from there, um, started chipping. And, um, but the, the funny thing is my dad always tells me he worked harder on other sports for me. Um, you know, he really wanted me to get into baseball and I just never could get into it. I think he built like a full backstop and, and everything in our, in our yard. And, he really just wanted to introduce me to everything, um, you know, introduce me to soccer. Uh, I think we were in a timeout and I was sitting on my ball and the coach was saying, all right, time to go back in. And I just sat on my ball and my, <laughs> my dad came over and was like, what are you doing? He's like, I looked, he, he told me, I look up, I looked up at him and said, I don't play soccer. <laughs> and then, so then soccer was out of it. Um, but yeah, I really, so football and golf growing up were my two sports that I love. Um, so I would say I played almost as much football um, as golf. And it was it was great for me growing up just because, you know, so many kids nowadays, um, their parents or even just them, like they only play one sport. And I think if you fall into that, like at, at a certain point, you do need to focus on one if that's what your passion is and that's what you want to do. Um, but, but growing up, I think it's great to just be an athlete and, and play different sports. So I played a ton of football, which was nice. I'd set the clubs aside for four months, not touch them. Um, I don't think my dad, I think my dad hid them from me. So I couldn't even um, find them. So the, the first couple of weeks of football season, I would be missing the, my clubs. But by the time we got into it, I was all in. Um, and then by the end of the football season, yeah, you know, I was, I was itching to get back out again, but really just, you know, I just loved getting the ball in the hole. And um, I think that's, I'm a very creative player and a very feel oriented player. And I think that's something that just resonated with me the most is, you know, I just love being out there and it's one of the only sports where, you know, you're, you're outside and in nature and just strolling around. And I think I just loved that whole side of it where, you know, growing up, I never really thought I was practicing. I was just out there kind of doing what I love, love to do. Um, and yeah, I, here we are. Very cool. Uh, Frankie, I've got a question for you. So you mm -hmm. started your collegiate career at University of Alabama and then ended up transferring to Florida Gulf Coast, which is also where our CEO, Brian Friedrichs, played uh, in mm -hmm. college as well. So share with us a little bit about some of your fondest memories of, of not only Florida Gulf Coast, but also uh, your time in uh, University of Alabama as well. Yeah, yeah. They're, it's funny because they were both very drastic, very, very different schools, um, different environment. And I think it was good for me. Um, you know, like we were talking about earlier, I've I've been to a lot of places, um, lived in lived in numerous spots and, and been to a lot of different schools. So I, I think um I mean it's I guess starting with Alabama, it's hard to pass up those football games. Those those are pretty sweet. Um any of those SEC matchups are always pretty electric, especially the evening games. Um but I think, you know, as a a uh, big football fan growing up. That's one of the things that drew me to Alabama um, was, you know, if they're always one of the best football, college football teams every year. Um, and I think just being around those, those guys and, and those athletes, you know, on my recruiting visits and stuff like that really drew me in um, as well as, I mean, the coaches at, at Alabama and the, the team that I was going in with and the guys that I knew were going to be there. Um, I had a great relationship with, with all of them and still do. Um, so I think that was the big thing for me in, in deciding to go to Alabama. I also like a lot of the courses there, um, big trees, um, bigger layouts and, um, you know, I mean, you have the Robert Trent, Trent Jones yeah. trail and a bunch of courses there. And, um, you know, golf in Alabama is still, I love, I love going back there. I think I did two or three of my, uh, Q, Q school stages in Alabama. So uh, Alabama has always been, been great to me. Um, so, but I would say, you know, kind of being a top, top five, top 10 golf school was, was something that I really wanted to, um, that's where I saw myself, um, getting recruited by numerous, uh, schools like that. You know, my goal in, in going to a place like Alabama was to win a national championship. Um, and unfortunately we weren't able to do that, but had a 
a decent run at it my, my freshman year. And then we just kind of had a lot of stuff going on. Um, one of my really close friends, Davis Riley, he was a senior at the time, decided to turn pro. Um, so then our, I think our team at the time he left, we were ranked like third or fourth in the country. And when he left, we, we struggled a bit. And I think a lot of us just felt like we needed to fill those shoes. Um, I think in the fall, because he left after the fall. In the fall, I think he had four top fives. Um, wow. So when he told me he was turning pro, I was like, I would too. <laughs> Please. Um, but, you know, he felt bad about it. And um, I think, you know, there was a lot of growing up that all of us needed to do that that freshman year um, or my freshman year. Um, and, yeah, going into the sophomore year, definitely had some higher hopes and um, just struggled, I think. You know, I think being around the right people is re- really important, especially for a game like golf um, and just putting yourself in, in the right circumstances to optimize your game and, and get the best out of yourself. And, you know, after being there for two years, um, I really don't have anything bad to say about it other than it just kind of felt like a square peg in a round hole and it wasn't working out all that great. Um, so I needed a change and I decided to transfer. Um, actually, it was during COVID, so everything was kind of shut down. Um, but I had two really close friends from Minnesota, Van Holmgren and Brady Madsen that were transferring to FGCU at the same time. And, you know, I'd never heard of FGCU. I couldn't even tell you where it was. <laughs> like I didn't know anything about it. And my, my buddy Van, he ended up flying down from Minnesota to Arizona, uh, during COVID. Um, and we hung out for a month. He just stayed at our place for a month because he wasn't able to play golf in Minnesota. So he flew down and just hung out. And I was just asking him questions and what he liked about it and just random stuff. And, um, you know, I was sharing with him, you know, I'm thinking about transferring and um, just kind of talking with him about it and ended up deciding to transfer. And I think I had it narrowed down to Texas, Florida Gulf Coast and Minnesota. But the tough thing with Minnesota is the weather. So yeah. <laughs> that one would have been a tough one. Um, so, yeah, I think FGCU, it was definitely new opportunities and very different. Um, you know, transferring in, we were ranked, I think, 257th in the country, um, which is close to last. Um, but, I mean, we didn't really care because we knew the guys we had coming in. We knew it was – We I think we had – fully fresh lineup there wasn't one guy that played the previous year that was in the lineup the next year so there were just a bunch of bunch of new blood um great location i mean for golf and just you guys have been to fort myers i assume it's it's pretty sweet um (laughs) and you know i i think for me it just felt like you know my my priorities in terms of um, where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do with my game were a, a little different. You know, obviously I'm not transferring to FGCU and then saying, all right, we're going to go win a national championship. Um, now, did we think it was possible? Sure. But, you know, there's a lot of work to be done and um, a lot of pieces of the puzzle to be put together. But I think it allowed me to have a little bit more freedom in my game and, and practice the way that, you know, I thought might be best for, for me. And, um, you know, just just learn from um learn from from guys there and also maybe help help lead the team in a way and um it was something i I really enjoyed and you know we had we had really really good dudes on the team it was a lot of fun um and it was funny going from you know the alabama budget to the florida gulf coast budget (laughs) um so it was it was fun though We, we had a great time and i think by the time or the time i graduated um we were ranked like 40th or 42nd in the country and made it to a regional for, I think we were the first uh, FGCU team to make it to a regional uh, via the rankings and not winning the conference championship. So that was, that was pretty neat. Um, but yeah, just still close with a, a ton of those guys and talk with them regularly. I actually just talked with our coach about two weeks ago. Um, but yeah, there is just, a lot of fun experiences from college and you know i think i got a little bit of the the best of both worlds you know you got the the big big school big campus great football team you got smaller school no football team um but just just great guys and just a wonderful environment very cool 
Very cool. Sorry, yeah, I've been a little, little long winded for you, but <laughs> no, no, that was great. No, it's I, awesome I, to hear the background. I was going to say, I'll, I'll add the first time I heard of Florida Gulf Coast was when you guys went pretty deep in March Madness for the basketball team there. And, yeah, Dunk uh, City. Yeah, Dunk yeah. City. That's right. Yeah. 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 And I, I think I saw photos of the dorms pretty much at the beach. Uh, and I yeah. said, yeah, I, I could see why people would want to go there. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> pretty. You're from Minnesota. It's... I'm from Michigan. So I, I can I can aspire <laughs> yeah. for that pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah, you can just see a picture of, because that's what Van was sending me pictures of where he was. I was like, dude. That's pretty sweet. Yep. <laughs> the funny thing is the actual beach, like the ocean, is about 15 minutes, I guess, west of there. Um, but there's a really big man-made lake that touches up to campus, and the dorms are around that. And then there's a beach there. But, but you can take out the boat and do a bunch of stuff and kayak, like paddleboard, do whatever you want. And it's funny you bring up Dunk City because they – I think it was back in 2014 – and they still play highlights to this day, or at least when I was there, probably two years ago, in the gym. And you know, I talked with our uh, our trainer. I'm like, dude, we gotta we gotta get some new stuff in here. This was this was almost a decade ago. We can't be living in the past this much. We gotta we need a team to to do something, and then we can put those highlights up there. Yeah, I very similar situation. I used to work at Mercer University, and their yeah. basketball still littered with the time they beat Duke. Which is awesome story, right? But you're like, yeah. this is super old now. <laughs> yeah. When uh, when was that? Oh, I don't even remember now. I mean, it was before 2015, obviously, because that's that's when I was working there. So it had okay. to be at least four or five years before that. And that was in March Madness, too. Yeah, they beat beat Duke in the tournament, um, second or third round or something like that, I believe. That's pretty sweet. Maybe it was the first round. It was one of those huge upsets. I'm not sure. Don't, Somebody's probably listening out there. It's screaming at me about man. this. So. <laughs> Don't they have a fairly solid um, team, like year in, year out? Yeah, they were they were always very good at, at men's and women's basketball when we were there. Yeah. And then uh, football was kind of yeah, FCS football. They're coming up. But like this year, they hosted and won a playoff game. So That's sweet. Right, I got some, some real-time updates for you guys. Here. Oh, here so, we go. They were a 14 seed, <laughs> knocked off three seed Duke. Three. There it is. Uh, so it's first in, round. This was in 2014. Oh, so it was only a year oh, before. So I thought it was. So I'm over here thinking it was three or four. So that might have been the same uh, same year as Dunk City. Then it might have been. Yeah, yep. could have been. It might have been. <laughs> did they go? How, how much farther did they go? I don't know. Can now, I tell you? now you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Frankie, you know, I don't watch that much basketball. So <laughs> stick to That's football right. and, yeah. and Frankie Sappin. Those are my two sports things right there. <laughs> Were we talking about Florida State when I was with you last? Yeah, we talked a little bit about that because I went yeah. there. So Yeah, but wasn't that – was that before they made the picks or was that after they made the picks for the playoff? Oh, that was before. Yeah. No, no, it was after because we were – what we You had a round with Brian in December, correct? After. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was like, after. like December 20th or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it would have been after. So if you're listening on the podcast, we're speaking about Florida State in the playoffs, which was very painful for me. Yeah. <clears throat> but enough about me. Let's get back to Frankie here. Tyler, you <laughs> want to go ahead? <laughs> yeah, no one really cares about me, to be honest. <laughs> That's not so, so, th- so we obviously have a pretty uh, unique connection with you, Frankie, having you and Brian both attended Florida Gulf Coast. Um, mm-hmm. I also know a little bit more of the story, but for our listeners out there, Tell us a little bit, you know, we're, we're fortunate to have been kind of your first sponsor as you turn professional. Um, but, you know, tell me about how, kind of how our sponsorship came about and, and how that's looked from your perspective over the last year, year and a half now that we've been engaged together. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think so, at least from from my side, it, it came through um, my agency, which I believe Mark Rakin is the one who reached out. And do you know, did he reach out to Brian directly? He did. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not entirely sure how he came about Capstone. However, you know, this was, this would have been um, roughly two to three weeks before the season started. My rookie season on Corn Ferry Tour, um, you know, my manager, Terry, he called me and goes, Hey, I think we have an opportunity for, um, partnership here with with a company and he the funny thing about him is he doesn't like to say anything until it's almost (laughs) like set in stone so i said okay sounds good just let me know um and yeah so then you know a couple weeks go by and he tells me all right capstone hospitality and you know we uh 
we should fly out to to Jacksonville and 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 meet with these meet with these guys and um you know I remember meeting who was it it was you Brian and was it Jim, just us three I think it was Jim as well our exactly that's right vice president that's right yep. yeah and Jim and we went out and and played in Jacksonville what was the name of that course again I think you guys were doing something with them yeah yeah it's one of our our local clients here in Northeast Florida so that's Marsh Landing Country Club down in Ponte Vedra Beach yeah. yeah so we played Marsh Landing and. I mean, I had a great time with you guys. It was it was a ton of fun, and then just kind of chatted about about you know what what it would look like and and certain things like that. Um, but but for me at at that time, it's it was just such a blessing because um, you know I had just graduated from school and you know just paid to go through Q school and like I didn't I didn't really have anything to to my name at at, at that point, and um, you know was was fortunate enough to 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 find you guys and and you guys be supportive of of me and my journey and and you know I think that's how a lot of great relationships start is really just reaching out and and seeing where it leads and um you know as you guys probably know as a professional golfer there's a lot of expenses that are going out especially <laughs> in the beginning um and especially on the Corn Ferry tour as well with you know the first two events being in the Bahamas and then you got to go to Panama and Colombia. So I think the biggest thing for me is it just allowed allowed there to be a little bit more freedom. Um and where I'm not, you know, over a putt saying, All right, if I if I don't make this I, I can't eat dinner <laughs> for the next couple <laughs> days. I need to save some save some cash. Um but yeah, I, I think just just having that, that relationship and obviously I, I love supporting you all and um just genuinely really appreciate the the support that I have gotten from, from you guys over the years, whether it's, you know, doing stuff like this or um, outings or, or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, I, I think, like I said, as a professional golfer, it's, it's important to have um, great partnerships on, on and off the course. And, and, you know, Capstone is one that I, I cherish and just, just love you boys. Yeah, we're we're fortunate. I remember our first time we came up to get some content and get some video and all that good stuff when you were playing up in Savannah, so just a few hour drive from headquarters for us. And yeah. Kyle and I are in the car and I'm like, aren't we gonna get there? But we need to stay a little incognito. Like we don't need to be up in his up in his hair. And I remember literally by the, the second fairway, you're walking, you know, between shots coming all the way to the rope to talk to us and say hey and we're like yeah. Whoa, like didn't expect that, but I think there's yeah. something to be said about obviously not only how you carry yourself, but also the way that you approach the game. And we'll talk a little bit about that here shortly as well. But um, no, we've thoroughly enjoyed it. I know we had to rush to get those shirts ready for you for the Bahamas uh, <laughs> a few years ago. Uh, but yeah, I know you're with Unreal uh, as a, a another sponsor of yours for the apparel. Um, yeah, they've, they've hooked us up with some good gear as well to wear for uh, our, our purposes as well for conferences and out going to see some clients. So uh, all good things, and we're we're happy to be a, a big part of of your career as well. Good. No, thank you. It's funny though, because I mean, a lot of times you guys know. I mean, a PJ Tour event, there's a ton of people. Obviously, U.S. Open last year, a ton of people. Corn Tour events, I mean, sometimes the busy ones, you'll get fifteen, twenty, thirty people watching. But usually, it's just you know anyone related to the player, or someone watching, or whoever it is. To where if I, it's pretty easy to notice somebody watching. Um, to where it's like if there's a break in what we're doing, I don't. I mean, we're out here for five hours. I'm only hitting shots for forty five minutes of it. May as yeah. well just hang out. Kyle almost had to take a lady out, by the way, on that same second oh. ball at the uh, at the, was at the par or was it the par three or the par five? Kind of par five. Right? Yeah, it par wasn't five. me. There's uh, a, but... there's, a, there's a lady on the phone. Wow, walking, walking next to the road on speakerphone, and multiple yeah. people said, "Ma'am, this is a professional golf tournament." And <laughs> Kyle is just building, and I'm like, "This is." This and is it was a, another lady who I believe knew you, Frankie. They were following you, and she just tore into her. I think it was your aunt. Uh, yeah, was it, yeah, was it your aunt or something? Yeah, Nancy. Sounds yeah. Like, I want to say like Nancy, and she <laughs> was just like, "Ma'am." Go somewhere else. <laughs> I mean, she was right to do it, oh, yeah. uh, but it was so funny. You know, I got in and uh, we'll tell this story real quick. I, I'm not sure if you're allowed to bring cameras in, but I walked in with a camera. No one said anything to me. Yeah. And so the first thing we do is we get up there and I take my first picture and I was like, I better turn the mechanical shutter off because I'm kind of yeah. right next to Frankie. I don't want to click. Yeah. So I turned the mechanical shutter off so you couldn't hear it. 
but it was so funny. We're getting through and people kept eyeballing me. I'm like, I wonder if we're not allowed to have this in here, but no one really say anything. So I just kept kind of clicking pictures as we rolled through and it was a, it was a fun afternoon of following you around. Good. So I'm glad. <clears throat> I'm glad I didn't get kicked out and like banned from corn fairy tour events. The, so. the flicker is the big one. I <laughs> yeah. would say. Well, on right, all the right new cameras, the the yeah. yeah mm -hmm. you can turn the mechanical shutter off on every new camera. It's if they're uh -huh. mirrorless, like the new, like we shoot a Sony a seven four for yeah. anyone listening that cares there's a mechanical shutter you can turn off on the new camera. So if they have a newer camera, they should be able to do it. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm not a 100% expert, but I'm, I'm pretty good with our equipment. We were able to do that. So, so the, the guy <laughs> back in 97, when tiger was on 18. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's 97. They didn't probably have couldn't shut that off. No, yeah. He just had yeah. a little, a little too early of the click. Yeah. 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 So no, but back to the, the story and, you know, a, our sponsorship with you, I think is such a great thing because I really think your personality fits up with us really well. And, uh, just the, the generalness of that. But when Tyler was just talking about getting the t-shirt ready by, by we, he meant me, I had to get on the horn with unreal. And they were like, we need yeah. a logo five seconds ago. So I'm getting all the logos ready and sending it over. And they're like, well, what colors do you want on what? And we're like, we don't care whatever yeah. Frankie wants, just put them on the shirt. We could care yeah. less. And that they were a like, big deal about the colors. <laughs> Yeah, they were so shocked that we were like, yeah, we don't care. And they were like, well, what do you mean? We're like, look, is the logo going to be on there? And they were like, yeah. And we we're like, okay, we're good with it. Perfect. And they were like, well, everyone else has a preference. We we're like, whatever makes them comfortable. We Make don't it care. Look good. <laughs> Make it look it's good. funny because <clears throat> they're, they're, they're unbelievable about, you know, embroidering and, yep. and getting them on there and, and stuff. Um, but sometimes, like, I feel like it's kind of just turned into white on dark and yeah. black on light. And every once in a while I'll get the green on like a plain white or like a plain black. Um, but I don't know. I like the green. I think the green is sweet. So whenever the green's on there, I, I'm a fan. Yeah. <laughs> I, I work so much with our green that I can tell you the color code to it, the six digit hex code. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so it's, it's such a fun thing. <laughs> So, you know, getting back to the golf piece here, all right, you, you've been on the tour for a year, you know, you're going, well, you're in your second year now. Can you talk a little bit about your approach, you know, and your routine before, during, and after a round of golf? You know, like, how do you get ready for it? What are you thinking during it? And then how do you feel afterwards? Yeah, I think, um, you know, pre-round, I would say there's a lot of things like on the physical side that I'm trying to dial in, um, whether it's, you know, I have a fairly specific type of warm up routine, like a workout, um, and just get my body loose, stuff like that. And then really just managing, you know, what time I'm eating. Um, you know, obviously tea times will, will fluctuate and, and change a fair amount. Sometimes you're super late, sometimes you're early, sometimes you're on the later end of early. So I think just dialing those, those things in, um, just making sure I'm, I'm going about that, that the right way. And, um, hopefully my, my body feels as, as good as it possibly can that day. Um, but, you know, aside from that, I think a lot of like pre-round stuff is more determined the night before. Um, at least for me, you know, I, I like marking the pins the night before we, we typically get them around seven, seven thirty, eight 8 PM. And that's when, when I'll go in and kind of just check out the pins, mark the pins in my yardage book and, really just kind of have a little bit of a strategy for that day. And at, at that time too, um, I'll be periodically checking the wind just so I have an idea of kind of where it's going to be going. Um, but aside from that, a lot of the prep work is, you know, Monday through Wednesday. So then, you know, Thursday, we were just playing. Um, really nothing to think about. Obviously, I'm, I'm pumped to be playing. There's always, you know, maybe a little bit of butterflies on, on the first tee, which I personally love. Um, you know, if you don't feel anything, I, I feel like it means you, you probably <laughs> don't care. Um, so I, I, I think for me is just once we tee off, it's really just playing. And I think that's something that I've been doing a little bit better job of this year is, you know, you know, no matter where, where we're at, what we're doing, like, all I'm trying to do is hit the ball. And, you know, not every shot's going to be perfect. I'm going to hit some really good golf shots. I'm going to hit some really bad golf shots. And, you know, you know no matter where that – the ball goes you, you just really just trying to do the same thing on, on the next one and, and learn from you know past mistakes but um also i think to a degree sometimes i've been you know 
focus too much on the mistakes to where it might happen again, as opposed to acknowledge it, assess it, and then move on. Um, because, you know, like last year, sometimes I get close to the lead and I get a little nervous and then maybe hit a squirrely one. And, and this year it's like, why? Why are we thinking about that? All we're trying to do is hit the best golf shot we can here. Um, so I think that's something that's helped, especially the last last few weeks with a few nice finishes. It really just, you know, I, like I said earlier, I've played all these courses before to where, you know, I I know where you want to go. But I think one of the more important things that I know where you can't go, like I, you just certain things you just can't do. Um, and then from there is really just just trying to play as free as I can. You know, I have. I have um, a lot of belief in, in myself and in my ability and, and what I can do with the golf ball um, and just allowing myself to, to have freedom and, and trust trust that. Um, and everything else, you know, I, I don't really love doing numbers on the course. Um, I try and have my caddy do as much of that just because it kind of goes back to my creative side is when I get to the ball, I'm kind of picturing a, a shot, seeing a shot, and then I'll get a number and kind of put all the pieces together and then create a feel and then just try and replicate that that feel um and just let my body um you know i've been playing golf for 22 years so i've hit all the shots before so (laughs) it's just kind of a matter of picking up you know which one do i want to play at this time with how i'm feeling with what feels comfortable and really just kind of putting those pieces together and then just just hitting the shot and going ahead and doing it again Frankie, um, I've, I've got a little bit of a nerdy golf question for you. Yeah. Um, in that component, I know most golfers have kind of a stock preference shot, whether it's off mm-hmm. the tee or hit a slight draw or with, you know, cut with irons. What is yours and how often do you find yourself going against that you know, situation? Yeah. yeah, I would say my stock shot with, uh, I would say a three wood all the way down would be just a little, kind of a little draw, just kind of gets up and falls left. And then as of late, I've been fading my driver. Um, I switched to a new driver, a Titleist driver, um, actually right before Savannah. Yeah, right before Savannah, put it in play on, actually it might've been the day of. Um, but I was thinking with some drivers. I don't know if you guys know, but Taylor May and I are no longer under contract. Um, okay. Oh, okay. And it just, yeah, it just had to do with you up. The, the ball and, yeah so um i thought you know at the time being it makes sense to just kind of play with what i feel like i play best with and um you know it seems to be working which is nice um but yeah so i i think i just struggled with um i mean i love taylor made like i wouldn't have signed with them if i don't love their stuff but with their new driver it seemed like i was just launching it a little too high so i wanted to bring that down and with bringing that down, it's a little easier for me to hit a fade, which is a little more controllable off the tee for me. Yep. Um, so to answer your question, I'd say it's kind of a fade with the driver, but falling left with with everything else. And then going against uh, that draw is, um, the I would say the better I'm hitting it, the more comfortable I am going against it, um, if that makes sense. Like if, if yeah. I'm just striping it, I'll hit anything. Yeah. Um, you don't mind going after feels, a back, back right pin with a slight fade yeah. if what it needs to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But if it doesn't feel all that comfortable, then I'll probably just aim just inside that pin and just hit a normal shot. Um, so it really just depends on the day. And I think that's something that I've learned over the years is, you know, Lee Trevino is out at our course periodically um, here in here in Dallas. And he talks about just, you know, every day is different. Your body's never going to be the same. Um, <clears throat> things are always changing to where, you know, he would just hit a slinging cut everywhere, but you go, some days I'd wake up, I hit it straight. Some days I'd wake up and it would almost be falling left. And, you know, by the fourth, fifth hole, I would just kind of figure out something to do and just go with it. And at the end of the day, our job is dictated by what number we put up on the board. So it doesn't always have to look pretty and it doesn't always have to be perfect, but you know, you got to post a number and. I feel like it's easier to post a lower number when you're not too caught up in um, how how pretty it looks or, you know, if you have your game that day because um, no one really cares. All that matters is, is what you put up there. 
No, no pictures on the scorecards. One of my favorite things exactly. in golf. Exactly. Awesome. Uh, well, Frankie, you're in your second year, as we've talked about on Corn Ferry Tour. So how have your experiences been up until this point? I think you've mentioned a little bit of more comfortability and knowledge of the courses you guys are playing kind of week in and week out. Mm -hmm. You've got a big portion of your schedule still ahead of you this year. But you know, what are your goals for this season? And, and tell us a little bit about the experience uh, of the 2024 season on the Corn Ferry Tour. Yeah, it's been uh, – I've played more this year than I did last year to start the year. Um, I skipped the tournament in Chile last year um, to actually move here. Um, but they added one down in Argentina. And since there were two then, Argentina and Chile, I figured it would make sense to go play both. Um, so I went and played those. So it's, it's definitely been a little more travel um, this year. However, you know, I think the more time and – uh, the more time you put into something or it becomes more um, habitual to a degree um, where I think, you know, I'm seeing a lot of the same guys. I know all the people out there to where it just feels a little, um, I don't know how to describe it, but it would just be simpler. Like I know if there's an issue with something or I need to, I need to figure something out. I know who to contact or, who to get in touch with or certain things like that. Whereas last year is like, okay, I think I might need this. Who do I talk to? Okay. Now I talk to them. Now, what do we do to where, you know, I think last year I just was meeting so many people and developing a lot of relationships where I feel like they're kind of coming into uh, like fruition this year where it's like, okay, I have a shaft guy. I know a guy with grips. I know a guy with this, this, this. So if I have an issue or if anyone I know, like my buddy uh, Van Holmgren, he just got his status out there. And I'm like, dude, if you need something, please just let me know what you need and I'll connect you with the, that person. Um, just because for, for me last year, like I'm pretty particular about how I like, you know, my equipment or certain things like that or really whatever it may be. Um, so I think I feel like I'm just a little more dialed on, on that side of things and it allows me to um, not be too concerned with, with, um any uh i guess distractions if that makes sense like i'm not i'm not too worried about other stuff like that and then the other thing too about even on corn fairy tour there's a lot more on pj tour but corn fairy tour there's so much stuff going on whether it's equipment or training aids or just random stuff out there that you can just dig yourself yeah. into a rabbit hole and i think <laughs> i did a little bit of that last year where this year it's like okay I do these two things for putting. I do these two things for my full swing. And I do these two things for just alignment and stuff like that. And like, I know that works. So I'm going to stick to that. And, you know, if there's a guy who's, you know, talking about his product on the putting green and all this stuff, I know that these are the two things I should be doing. And I probably shouldn't be wasting my time, you know. Now, if it's, if it's interesting and it, it, like, I think there's a fine line between being, um, like you want to be open to some change, but if you know something works, then why would you go away from it? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Curiosity so, versus just forcing change just because. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that would be one thing that's, that's big. And then, um, you know, I think I feel very confident in, in Rusty and in the relationship that we've developed to where um, I think last year I got, a little bit more tired on the road. Um, and part of that might be because my mom was caddying for me, I was doing more numbers and more homework on the course as opposed to just more focusing on my golf game. Um, where this year, you know, to start the year, I had a, a different caddy and he was a good caddy, a uh, really good caddy, it just didn't work out personality wise. Um, however, I think just having a more professional caddy has helped me because. You know, I don't need to worry about how many paces the the pin is tucked over that back right bunker. Um, I know he's got that info, and if I need it, I'll ask. Um, now, I'll do a little bit and mark the pins and have a rough idea of the wind, um, like I mentioned earlier, but it's not like I need all of that information in my head um, while I'm trying to hit a golf shot. I, I know he's got that covered, and then, you know, ideally I have my side of it covered as well. So I think – those are two big things. Um, and then just understanding how much we do travel and taking advantage of, of days off 
um, whether it, you know, I think people say, okay, you know, you have an off day, you're not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit on the couch for 10 hours when it's really, you know, I'm going to do some PT, I'm going to do like some sort of um, recovery type workout. And then, you know, I'm going to eat three good meals and, you know, maybe chill in the evening and then go on my computer, respond to some emails and do get ahead on, on that side of stuff, as opposed to just doing nothing <laughs> or just not stopping. Cause last year I, there were times where, you know, maybe I would have a, maybe I'd miss a cut and then we'd have an off week and I would just want to grind on the off week and I'd just be hit, hitting balls, practicing all day long. And then by the time we got back going, I was like, man, I've just kind of wiped. Um, so I think just taking advantage and understanding where we're at in the season and um, just realizing like, you know, to, for me to play my best, I don't need to go hit balls for eight hours. You know, if I do two, three hours of really good practice, and do some other things, um, you know, I'm going to be, be in a good spot. And it was kind of funny because, so the Veritex ended and I did the Byron Nelson Monday in the morning and then Van was teeing off in the afternoon and I actually caddied for him. So after two weeks in a row, I caddied, I played in the morning, I shot five under, I think it took eight under. Um, so, but when I finished, I, I knew I missed it. Like, there wasn't any chance 500 was going to get in. So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll caddy for you. Um, <laughs> and it was funny because all the caddies were like, dude, what are you doing? I was like, yeah, I'm just having fun. Like, I want to caddy for my buddy. Um, but, you know, the next day I felt it. I definitely felt <laughs> it. And then um, this had nothing to do with caddying, but I had, you know, Tuesday, I, I actually really did not do much on Tuesday. But then, uh, Thursday morning, I was hitting some balls and, you know, I took the club back and my wrist just shot up in pain. And I had something I'd never have had, ha had happened before. And, um, you know, long story short, it, it gave me two off-ish days, which wasn't the worst thing in the world. I think probably a good thing at the end of the day, um, just because I've been hitting and practicing a fair amount and obviously playing as well. Um, so I think, you know, to, to answer your question, I think just taking advantage of, of some, some downtime and, and doing the right things in that downtime. Yeah, that's such a good point of, right, prioritizing rest is a big deal for athletes. And sometimes when athletes are younger, they, they do that a little less. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a wise lesson to learn there. Uh, real quick question, did, you know, after caddying, did he tip you? <laughs> no. I told him, <laughs> no, no. I told him, uh, he, he actually missed a cut in <laughs> Texas, and obviously we, we didn't win, but we had a nice week to where I told him. I was like, dude, you're fine. <laughs> Just you're, fine. <laughs> you're, you're fine. I figured, but, you know, you know, I had to ask the question. I had to ask it. So we went out to a nice dinner. I treated him to some Korean barbecue. Ooh. Um, and I don't know if you guys like Korean barbecue, but it's, oh, yeah. you know, it's really good. Um, <laughs> so my buddy... Uh, one of my best friends, his name is Ben Wong. He went to SMU, so he's familiar with Dallas. So he told me about a really good gym place, and I knew about it. Um, and so I, I knew it was going to be really good. He didn't mislead um, you. Yeah, he nailed it. Yeah. And we went, and I told him I got dinner, and he Van took care of the tip. I was like, that's all I need. <laughs> so it, it worked Perfect, out well. Perfect, right? Yeah. So last year, uh, kind of a big piece of, you know, you, you were in year one of the Corn Ferry Tour, but uh, had to be a pretty big highlight for you to qualify and go play in the U.S. Open. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and how exciting it was, especially, you know, as, as a young professional and, and what that really did for you? Yeah, yeah, it was great. I mean, for me to qualify and for my first major, um, first year as a pro is, is pretty neat. Um, and it was just a, such a sweet opportunity. And, um, you know, the week, it really is kind of a circus that, that week, like U S open. Um, there's just a lot of stuff going on. And I think to a degree, I, that might've been one of my biggest learning points, um, from, from last year as well as I know exactly how not to treat my next major, <laughs> like going into that week, I was thinking, okay, we're going to, it's a long course. Um, we're going to have a bunch of like longer shots in. So I went from like a driver three wood, three iron to driver three wood, five wood, three iron, and then switched wedges to different lofts. Um, and it was funny because 
Wednesday morning, I was out walking the course and I heard from a caddy that Rory had switched the other way. He went to four wedges and then only like two, two woods and like a driver in a three wood. And at that moment I was thinking, yeah, I I think I screwed up here. Um, <laughs> That's not but, what you want to overhear when you're walking the fairways yeah, on Wednesday. And yeah. it, was, it was funny because like, I got there on Saturday, which was way too early. Um, but I wanted to get the you know U.S. Open vibes, like the whole, wow, this is my first major. This is really cool. I wanted to get that out of the way to where yeah. Thursday, it's like, okay, it's just another golf event. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, Sunday through Tuesday, I was trying to figure out these two wedges or like one <laughs> less wedge and one on the top. And then he switched Wednesday morning. And I was like, well, I can't really switch back because now I just did all that work for this. And um, <laughs> so I think just, you know, sticking with what you uh, are comfortable with and, you know, I think necessary change is, is fine. Like I'll switch between a five wood and a three iron depending on the course, but really other than that, just kind of sticking with, with what you, um, um you know sticking with what got you there um but you know that week there's just a ton of distractions uh just a laundry list of distractions and i think just getting a little maybe a little bit too wrapped up in in those as opposed to um you know being there to compete um and i think it was definitely more of a a fun event than a competition um to where i think you know once we started and I was playing, I think that I realized like there were better ways to go about it. And I'm glad it happened um, because I feel like I, I learned a lot, but really just, just understanding like my mentality going into it was, you know, people talk about how it's, um, you know, it's, it's just another tournament versus for me, I, I always like elevating it more. Um, in my head to where acknowledging how big of a tournament it is. But then at the end of the day, it's still just golf. Yeah, It is the U S open. It is like, it's the pinnacle of golf in America. Um, I guess USGA wise, but at the end of the day, it's still just golf. So I think just looking at it that way helped me a lot. Um, but I, I think just kind of getting a little bit too wrapped up in the distractions and, and, some equipment stuff and just miscellaneous things like that might have derailed a little bit of how I played. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, putting yourself in those situations more and, and feeling those emotions is, is only going to help. Um, so, you know, my next major, I'd definitely be more aware of, of how I want to handle that week and um, probably make necessary change. And I would guess you'd probably see some better results. Frankie, you've got my cell phone. Next major, just text me if we're thinking about any club changes. I'll, I'll, remi I'll remind you of this. I'll say, "Hey, pal, let's let, let's let's keep going with what we've got." So, um, this is a very cool component of your story. Is how you flew through Q School. I think the even more unique aspect of it is who was on the bag for you. You mentioned briefly, mm -hmm. you know, your mom has been a caddy for a lot of success that you've seen in your uh, young professional career. On that note, you know, there were some cool clips coming out from the Veritex of you, you know, having the family there being, a, you know, a, a home game for you in Texas. Tell me a little bit about kind of what that means to you, your family, the support. It seems like you guys are, you know, as tight knit of a, a sports family. Uh, your sisters are out at your events all the time. So tell us a little bit about kind of, again, your family, the support that they provide and how that's been so important for you. Yeah. No, like you said, I'm, I'm blessed with a tremendous family, obviously mom mom and dad and, and then two sisters and um i think you know the two things my dad would always tell me growing up is do your best and have fun um and i think for me it's like he he's really told my sisters that as well in, in whatever they do and um you know just just to have them out there and and, and their support it means a lot um just because i know they have stuff going on too but for them to take time and and, and be there for me it, it's it's really meaningful um, and you know, my sisters, they never really liked golf growing up. And I think it's funny because the more events they come to, I think the more they like it. And, you know, I think they're, they're trying to scope out the talent in terms of themselves because they're both single. 
So I think, I think it's, I think it's fun for them. A lot of times they're asking me, Hey, what do you think about this guy? And I'm like, no, not him. <laughs> like, what about him? I'm like, yeah, he might be good. Um, but no, there it's just, it, it means a lot. I think, um, obviously my, with my mom being on the bag last year, it was important for my dad to be there as, as well for, for her. And if she needed anything and obviously them just being together. Uh, but yeah, like you said, um, had a lot of success with, with my mom and, um, you know, her being on the bag, I think it gave me a little bit of, of that freedom to agree. Like, like I talked about earlier. Um, now there, my job was, there were more components to my job on the course than, than there are now. Um, which it's nice to kind of lighten that load a touch. Um, but, but just to have them out there and, and to have their support, it, it means the world to me. And, you know, I'm, I couldn't be more, more thankful for them and just the opportunities that they've given me throughout my life. I mean, I remember driving four hours at three in the morning to a tournament in Wisconsin or, you know, flying across the country to go play in a, a junior event. Um, so I, I think, you know, just everything they've done, I, I, I definitely wouldn't be where I'm at and, and the person I am with, without them. Um, so for, for that, I'm extremely thankful. Yeah, it's it's great. And I see it, you know, even on social media, how much they support you. I mean, your your family, you know, I, I follow you closely and I run our social media here at Capstone. I mean, they beat me to the punch when it talks about putting up the IG stories of you and everything else. So sometimes <laughs> I actually just follow them to figure out yeah. what to put on our story. So fun fact, they are definitely always in your corner and such a tight knit family. It's really, really cool to see. And it's a it's a great thing for you. So we're going to get to our last question here. You know, we, we talked a lot of golf, a lot of golf, Frankie. Yeah. So outside of golf, what do you, what are your interests? You know, what do you do to relax and, yeah. and hang out and kind of have that balanced lifestyle? Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's, I think it's still something I'm trying to figure out too. Um, you know, during the season, it's, it's tough to get away from it. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of times I just feel like there's, there's a lot of stuff to do off the course as well. And I try and do my best of you know, taking care of those things and, and staying on top of it. Um, I actually, like I'm looking at my to-do list of <laughs> a couple of things I need to take care of. Um, but, you know, there's, I think for me is, um, you know, I like to describe myself as an athlete that plays golf as opposed to a golfer. I think there's a noticeable difference between certain, um, like people that are just golfers versus athletes that play golf. And so really any athletic activity is something I love to do. Now I've had to be a little bit more careful. I can't <laughs> just go to the gym and run, you know, uh, like blacktop or like, like, uh, you're not, you're not back playing in the pick day. up basketball. At <laughs> yeah. I'm not playing pick up basketball anymore, but you know, maybe just going and, and shooting hoops. Um, uh, pickleball is one that I, I've enjoyed a lot. Um, that's fun. And then disc golf is, is pretty fun too. Um, so I think, you know, kind of a mixture of those three, throwing them on the football too. Um, but, you know, really just any athletic activity is something I enjoy doing. Um, you know, my dad was telling me I should probably try to get into fishing or something like that. There's a, <laughs> there's a, like a creek and a lake that runs through Merido and I see a bunch of guys out there fishing. So I might have to, might have to get into that a little bit, but you know, not, not a whole lot. Um, Whenever I'm not just kind of chilling, I, I enjoy, um, you know, just like working out and practicing is, is, is a lot of it. But the one thing, too, is being in Dallas. Uh, like I went to the Stars game on Sunday. That was a lot of fun. It was a game seven, um, which was pretty sweet. But, yeah, no, not, not a whole lot. I think just, just really other sports and not a huge TV guy. Don't don't watch much TV. I love to listen to music though. Um, podcasts as well. I listen to some podcasts. Actually, are you is are you guys on Spotify? We are. We're on. It's a great segue there. We are, we're on Spotify. We're on Apple, and we're on YouTube. So we do all three. So yeah, we're on there. Um, I'll have to follow it. I just <laughs> started following it already, but I'll have to follow it and listen to a couple of them. But, yeah, I think, like you said, I think that's something I'm just I'm still trying to figure out, um, just to create a little bit of a balance, just because when I go all in, it's, it can be a lot, um, but it's something I'm excited to, to keep figuring out what it, what it may be. 
Yeah, I mean, that's what we all are in life, right? We're always constantly evolving. Me and Tyler are a little older. We're dads now. We're probably still trying to figure out what we do to uh to blow <laughs> off some steam and get away from it. So, right, right, Tyler? No doubt, Kyle. No doubt. <laughs> I'll say the one thing I continue to pick up on, uh, Frankie, is the, the, the competitive nature. You know, yeah. the, the other sports, even as you were talking about kind of the burnout from – you know, playing as many different sports growing up, which I'm a huge proponent of. So, yeah, I, I, I could tell from our first round together at Marsh Landing that you were a, a true competitor about everything you do. So I think yeah. that's going to obviously carry you very far. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I think Contre had like an interview and they're asking me about winning and stuff. And like, I mean, I just kind of enjoy beating other people. It's fun. Like, <laughs> no matter what it is, I would like... I mean, you don't want to be a poor sport. Like, if I get beat, I get beat. You know, I shook Tim's hand and said, dude, incredible playing. Like, yeah. you just lapped us. Like, great stuff. I played with him Saturday, Sunday. He played great. Um, and it's like, dude, yeah, congrats. If you were to beat me in no matter what it is. No good stuff. I might be a little butt hurt for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we're not. We're not. We're we'll not. just. We'll run it back, and I'll, I'll get you the next time. That's right. <laughs> That's right. No one goes yeah, out teaming a... for for second place or third place, and obviously golf's a especially tough one because there's so many people in every field that you tee it up in. But yeah, that mentality of going to win everyone. I texted Terry uh, actually right before Texas, right before it started. I said, "Dude," because I was coming off like a ninth and an eighth. And I think lost by four and then like three. So I was pretty close. Yep. Like, and I was like, dude, I'm just so tired of losing. I was like, <laughs> winning is just going to be so much more fun. Um, he's like, you're, you're getting there. It's, we're, we're progressing in the right direction, which is, which is fun to see. Um, so right. I know our time will come. I'm going to make you verbally commit right now on the spot here, Frankie, on the airwaves. Right after the win, we're, we're getting back on this podcast and firing it up. Perfect. Yeah. I love it. That's a... I'll probably be at I'll probably be at Waffle House. I told myself <laughs> that my celebratory meal is going to be Waffle House. Love You're it. pulling the Trevor Lawrence. I'll I like it. The, They're always yeah, open, pull, man. Yeah, I'll pull out the uh, the laptop in the Waffle House and we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk shop. Listen, if you know us, you know there's nothing more that we'd like for you to be on the podcast with us or on a video chat at Waffle House. All right, that's right up our alley. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. So you're, you're talking to the right guys right here. So, <laughs> well, perfect. Frankie, we don't want to take up too much of your time. We really appreciate you hopping on. Um, if you're out there and you're you're a golf you know person, or sorry, you're an avid golf fan, you know, follow Frankie. He's on the Corn Ferry Tour, currently ranked 22nd, correct? You probably don't even know. Tyler, we've looked it up, right? 22nd, right. somewhere in there. Yep. Um, having a great year in year two. So, you know, Frankie, obviously, you know, we'll be following you. We appreciate everything. Thank you for coming on the Club Innovators podcast. No, thank you for having me. I was always blessed to be with you guys. And thanks thanks for everything. I look forward to hopping on at Waffle House soon. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. All right, guys. See you guys. Take care, Tyler. Bye, Bye.